Hello and welcome to this presentation on contamination control, the key to gearbox reliability. In this presentation we're going to talk about a few things, how liquid and particulate contaminants affect the lubricant, the gears and bearings within a gearbox, how to reduce the likelihood of contamination with new storage and dispensing techniques, modern breathers and other techniques, and how to use filtration to remove contaminants and wear particles. So, before we get into that, let's have a look at what is at stake. Why is it so important to uh, take care of the lubricant? This is a study, uh, well, this is a, a case study from a Japanese steel mill. And by going through a contamination control program, they achieved a 50% reduction in bearing purchases plant-wide. Now this goes beyond gearboxes, but you can see this would translate to gearboxes. An 80% reduction in hydraulic pump replacement, a 75% reduction in oil consumption, a 90% reduction in pump overhauls, and a 90% reduction in frequency of lubricant failures. Um, and it's worth saying, I mean, those results there that you can see, they're uh, very impressive, and based on those results, if you achieved anything like that, it would well and truly pay for uh, the cost of uh, improvements to uh, the lubrication process. But remember, too, that on top of those benefits, um, you have the reduced labor costs, the reduced downtime, the, re the improvements in safety, and there are other benefits as well. So there's a a lot of benefits to going through this process. Let's have a look at another example. This is an Australian steel mill and they achieved a 92 percent sustained reduction in bearing failure rates after just three years and an almost three-fold increase in mill speed by improving filtration of their lubricants. So you can see they increased the speed of the mill they could because they improved reliability and they found they could run it faster without failures and at the same time reduced bearing failures. Now I'm going to come back to this case study a little later so I won't mention anything else just for the moment. So <clears throat> if you've looked at uh, our previous presentation on defect, elimin uh, defect elimination, let's just see how the lubrication fits into that picture. In that presentation we talked about the various stages or various opportunities to introduce defects. So you know, first here we're looking at what we can do to make sure that defects do not get into our plant. So part of that is making sure that the lubricant that comes in is, is in good nick. Uh, second was the sort of maintenance, the, the workflow plan, the inventory management and, and all of that and then what happens under operation. So lubrication is a major contributor of defects, but when we look at how we go about eliminating contam um, contaminants, um, we can once again examine each of these elements to see where the lubricants can get in. So number one, is the wrong lubricant being used? Is too much or too little lubricant being used? And that's really in the case of grease. Well, too little lubricant if you let your gearbox run dry or something like that, but um, certainly in the case of greasing it's not lubricating it often enough or over lubricating it and <clears throat> the lubricant itself becoming contaminated and that's what we'll spend a lot of time on today. But when you think about the purchase process and the transportation of that lubricant, the storage of the lubricant, the importance of lubrication when you do the go through the installation and commissioning process and while you're operating the machine the frequency with which you lubricate in the case of a bearing or replace the lubricant is all very important particularly when it comes to contamination control but we'll talk about all of this as we go along so what is so important about the lubricant um, as you can see from those results we saw a moment ago, now you may not be in a steel mill but you just have to translate all of this to your particular plant, there is probably no other single action that improves reliability in the plant more than ensuring that machines, you know, bearings and gears in this particular case, are lubricated correctly. It is critically important to the reliability of the plant. The, the lubricant is there to perform a very important role. It's there to keep the surfaces 
apart and we'll look at that more in just a moment. It's there to minimize friction and therefore minimize wear but the friction part of it is all about energy consumption and so on and with friction comes wear and that degrades the uh, component and you know, means replacement is going to be required sooner than otherwise. And it's used to cool the asset and therefore maximize the life of the asset. So they are all very important. You know, there's a whole science of lubrication, you know, tribology that uh, <clears throat> is, is there to make sure that the correct lubricant is used and we don't want to do anything to uh, contaminate that lubricant or introduce contaminants that might damage the surface of the machine components. We need to think about the bearings themselves, so we'll look at the gears in a moment, but just the bearings. You know, those bearings are obviously doing an important job. They're taking potentially tremendous load within that gearbox, and we have to think about what's happening right down here where the rolling element is, is moving through the, the load zone of the bearing. You know, what's keeping those metal surfaces apart? Um, in actual fact, the, the, the bearing itself and the inner and outer race um, of the bearing uh, is under tremendous pressure as those rolling elements roll along. Um, in fact the metal deforms and deflects slightly with with every passage of the rolling element. Now I'm exaggerating things in this animation but that is what's going on but that's what the bearing is designed to do. It's, it's designed to go under that tremendous load and the, the metal you know, the metallurgy and the design of the bearing and everything is designed for that bearing to do that particular job. Hopefully the right bearing has been chosen, but that's another story. <clears throat> um, so that's what the bearings are uh, undergoing inside a gearbox. Think about the gear teeth themselves. You know, during this meshing process, depending upon the load on the gearbox, you can imagine as well that the forces between those gear teeth are uh, tremendously high and the lubricant is there to keep those surfaces apart. Now, if we were to travel down in size to look at the surfaces of the gear or the bearing at a microscopic level, we can see that the surfaces are not perfectly smooth. They may look it to the naked eye, um, but they are not. They have, as you can see, these little indentations and, and rough spots, and you know, uh, you might think, well, it's not very important, but this uh, image here is, well, roughly to scale. The fact is that the gap between these two surfaces, whether it's in the rolling element bearing, there's more in a journal bearing, uh, and uh, between the gear teeth, is just a micron or less. Now, soon I've got some slides that put a micron into perspective. A micron is a millionth of a meter. A millionth of a meter. Um, and that's all that's holding those two metal surfaces apart. That's what the lubricant's there to do, holding those surfaces apart. In fact, the lubricant temporarily turns into a solid at that point. Um, but you can therefore just imagine, number one, we don't want contaminants to get in between those two surfaces, or they'll damage those surfaces. But number two, we want the lubricant to do the job it was designed to do. The, the correct lubricant was designed for this purpose, understanding the the nature of the the wear, you know whether it's sliding contact or rolling contact, and the and the pressure at this point, um, that's why there are different lubricants, and you do not want to use the wrong lubricant. Um, We'll talk a bit more about that. But the, the lubricant itself has certain properties. Viscosity is one of the key ones. Viscosity is sort of like the slipperiness of the oil. Imagine rubbing it between your fingers and it's slippery. Well, that slipperiness affects uh, you know, how the lubrication process works, of course. And you know, different viscosities are used, whether it's a big, heavy, low-turning but high-load gearbox versus something that turns at a much higher speed and perhaps is under less load or whatever the situation. You know, we used to have an advertisement here by Castrol, oils ain't oils. Well, it's true, you know. Number one, you need the, the a good quality lubricant, but it needs to meet the purpose. And just using another lubricant because it was available uh, is obviously not a great idea. So let's look at the topic of contamination. Technically, Contamination is any foreign or unwanted substance that can have a negative effect on system operation, life, 
or reliability. And when we talk about, and we're really focusing in this presentation about the oil lubrication, but the contaminants can include solid particles, dirt, dust, and even the wear particles from within the machine, all contaminate the lubricant and, as we'll see, affect the life of the components. We've got liquids such as water, which is a major uh, contaminant, but also fuel in the case of engines, you know, diesel engines and so on, and um, incorrect lubricants. So you've got a certain viscosity oil that's supposed to be used in a gearbox. When you add the wrong oil, that becomes a contaminant because it affects the ability of the lubricant to do its job. And there can be gases uh, within the lubricant, so free and dissolved gases, in particular air. And they are all contaminants. As I say, the lubricant's there to do a job. We don't want to hinder its ability to do that job. So now this slide's very complicated, and of course you can pause it, pause the movie now, and and look at that slide in more detail. But the main point is that we have various sources of contamination. There are built-in sources. In other words, when we get that gearbox, there can be burrs and machine swarf, uh, weld splatter, abrasives, and and all the rest already within the gear, <coughs> uh, the, within the gearbox. And um, we have to make sure, therefore, we flush the gearbox and make sure that it's um, uh, uh, free of all those particles before we start using it. So we've got to remember that's one source of uh, contamination. And then the ingested uh, sources of contamination. So that's contaminants that have come from the outside somewhere uh, into the lubricant. So from the process itself, it might be compressed air, pulp. Uh, some of the examples you'll see in a moment come from an uh, iron ore mine, so obviously the dust from the iron ore mine can be a contaminant in a cement plant. Uh, we can have contaminants, but obviously there's lots of sources that can come from the process from the atmosphere itself. So we can breathe into the gear the uh, moisture and dust and so on. If the tank doesn't uh, close properly, we can easily get dust and water coming in. Uh, so there's lots of sources of contaminants that can, that can come from the uh, atmosphere. And if we're looking at a combustion process, we can get contamination that way as well. Then we can have contaminants that are actually generated within the machine because of either, you know, related to the surfaces, so the wear itself produces metal particles which themselves become contaminants and can cause additional wear. We can have wear due to corrosion, cavitation within the lubricated surfaces, etc., etc. Um, and uh, also generated within the oil itself, so as it degrades. We have additive depletion, sludge, oxides, etc. So these are all sources of contaminants. And then we have to consider the maintenance process. So when we're doing repairs, are we adding contaminants? Doing PMs of any sort where we might be performing inspections or whatever, are we adding contaminants? When we add a new filter, are there contaminants? When we add the oil, there probably will be contaminants unless we take precautions. Um, dirty hoses, fittings and components, um, uh, top-up containers, uh, using the wrong fluids. Uh, when, <clears throat> when we take oil samples, we can introduce contaminants. So these are all important sources, and we could talk about this for a lot longer, but won't. Um, so the next issue to consider is basically how do we, how does contamination affect the lubrication of the gearbox and the life of the gearbox. So number one, it affects the lubricant properties. We've, just, we've established that the lubricant has a certain job to do. Contamination degrades that ability. Next, the contamination, particularly water, will uh, corrode the surfaces of the bearing and gears. Um, and last but not least, the particles that might come in, you know, dust and dirt and metal particles can damage the surface of the, of the uh, bearings and gears. So let's have a look at how we might degrade the lubricant itself. Um, as I've said now enough times, the lubricant has a certain job to do. It's got, added, it's got viscosity, it's got certain additives, uh, and we want to man maintain those levels. Water is one of the most common 
uh, sources of contamination. And we can look here at this picture of, of an oil sample without water and then increasing levels of water. And it's really hard to tell. You have to look at those closely to be able to see that there's actually any water in the lubricant. So let's have a look at the effect of water on the life of a of a bearing. So here we've got the percentage of bearing life and the percentage of water in oil. And so at this point with just you know trace amounts of water we expect to get 100 percent of bearing life. We have to be realistic about how much water we can keep out of the oil. So that's our baseline if you like. There's 100 percent of expected life from the bearing. But as you see as we increase the percentage of uh, water in the oil, we get less and less and less life from the bearing. So down at this point here, which is just 0.1 of a percent of water in oil, just 0.1, we're down to 25 percent bearing life. Now what that means is, if you think about, you know, you're going to add a bearing to a machine, you've spent all this money for the bearing and installing it and all the rest of it, and you expect a certain life from that bearing. That's what you're paid for. Um, when you've got just 0.1% water in oil, you're down to 25% of its life. You're going to get a quarter of its life. Now, why am I picking on 0.1%? Because technically, it's only when you've got 0.1% of water in oil that you can see you can see the cloudiness of the oil changing. So anytime you take an oil sample and you hold that sample up to the light, you know, as we've sort of done here, we're looking at this and saying, you know, what what can we see? You know, can you really tell that there's water in the oil? You know, probably not. And if you can, that means you know the water, the oil is obviously very heavily contaminated and um, you know the life expectancy of the machine is therefore greatly reduced so therefore you can see that you know removing water from the oil is extremely important now I say removing the water that's one part really what you got to do is stop the water from getting into the oil in the first place um, you know in the case of journal bearings we can see that water increases the wear rate and thus reduces the life of the bearing. So you can have journal bearings uh, inside a, a gearbox and here's you know what it looks like with no water we just get some sort of linear in increase in wear but you know with increasing uh, amounts of water we get a degradation in life. Now <clears throat> why does water get into the oil? Now one of the reasons is because of washdowns, poorly sealed reservoirs, uh, condensation and through breathers. Now we'll talk more about breathers later, particularly as as they assist with removing particles from the air. Um, but they all, you know, one of the main jobs they perform is to reduce, remove moisture from the air. So you can have these desiccant breathers that remove the moisture. So as the air passes through the breather, um, the moisture is sort of drawn out of the air and thus the air that gets to the lubricant is dry and therefore we don't get this contamination. Now obviously if you looked at your plant and you saw this kind of thing, you know, you'd have to assume, okay, well that's, that surely can't be a, a good thing. Yeah, in this case we've got all sorts of stuff sitting there that can get into the gearbox and I'll show you some pictures later that are, that are pretty bad as well. Um, another source of moisture contamination is with the um, uh, drums of, of oil being left outside. So you can get rain sitting on top, you can get snow sitting on top of these uh, drums, you know, depending on where you are located. Now what happens is as that drum heats up and cools down during the day, uh, when it expands it comes under pressure and some air can be released. When it cools down it contracts and it can suck air in. So even though these are supposed to be sealed, there will be some passage of air air and therefore uh, moisture from the atmosphere and certainly moisture that's sitting up on top that just gets sucked straight in and you know depending on how long these very expensive and precious drums of oil are sitting out there uh, it can become quite contaminated before you ever put it into your machine. Now you may be asking well gee you know they're stored outside because we don't have anywhere undercover to store them. Well just 
Think about the importance of the lubricant. Think about the case studies, the brief case studies that we've already been through and, and consider all the things that I'm talking about in this presentation regarding contamination and so on. Um, it is surely worth a bit of money to create some sort of storage environment, even if it's not part of a normal, you know, normal building. Uh, you know, some sort of storage to keep the moisture and uh, water and snow off these drums. It is worth the money. You know, everything that I'm talking about in this presentation, on the one hand, is sort of common sense. There's no rocket science involved. There's no great technology. We're just trying to keep water and contamination out of the oil. We're going to do tests to see if we've been successful, and we're going to do tests to see if the uh, oil is still sort of fit for purpose. Um, uh, it's, there's no sort of rocket science, but there is a little bit of an investment. And with any investment, it means that there has to be priority. You know, we can all spend our money in different ways, and you can get all kinds of pressure to try and save money. This is not an area to save money. You know, not not creating some sort of proper storage area, not spending the time to properly lubricate machines. You know, it's ironic that sometimes when companies want to save money, the first thing they look at is the is the person doing the lubrication work, and that's like the last place you want to. Uh, make those savings. Um, you know, to a very large extent, the the success of your reliability program rides on the shoulders of the person doing the lubrication. You know, they are the ones that have to make sure that the machine's lubricated on schedule with the correct lubricant, with the lubricant that's not contaminated, and not contaminating the lubricant as part of the uh, oil top-up uh, process. You know, think about the qualities of the person you want to do that role and the importance of doing that role. And so the next time you go to save money, do not put that person in your in your sights. You know, in your uh, yeah, that's not a source of of savings for sure. Anyway, so moving right along, water contamination can cause fluid breakdown, such as additive precipitation, oil oxidation, acid formation thickening, varnish and sludge. Now all these topics we could talk about more but we won't. Um, water contamination can also reduce, uh, cause a reduction in lubrication film thickness. So we said earlier that there's a you know, one micron gap between these surfaces but if we let it get as close as we're seeing here then we are going to get wear. You know <clears throat> those uh, medical metal uh, Protrusions there will uh, make contact. We'll get welding, you know, cold welding, and we could talk about the various forms of uh, wear. But the fact is, we we want to maintain that mil, uh, micron or whatever is required for this particular machine can be less than a micron. Uh, water reduces that that thickness. Water. There are other problems as well: foaming and air entrainment problems, bacterial and fungal growth. Poor filtrability, as in it, it, you know, the water affects your ability to filter the oil, reduce dielectric properties, and in some cases, you know, if you're in a cold enough area, it can cause icing as well. So, all of these topics we could talk about for a long time, but you can see, you know, that water is getting into the lubricant and it's obviously affected the lubricant. We've got foaming as well. You know, it's clear that this lubricant cannot be doing a good job for the machine. It just can't. Um, Something to briefly consider is the level of oxidation. So we can perform a test, uh, TAN, total acid number, to see what level of oxidation is occurring. Now, you, you expect that uh, the TAN value to increase over a period of time. And if the oil is clean and dry, then that's the increase in TAN that you might expect. Um, if there happen to be iron and copper particles or elements within the oil, perhaps through the wear process, um, then that level of oxidation will increase. If there is water, so no copper and iron, just water, you can see that the oxidation level will increase. So that's a bad thing. So water contamination is a bad thing. But if there is copper and iron uh, elements within the uh, the lubricant as well, then the water combines, so with water and copper and water and iron, we see the oxidation rate 
greatly increases. So yes, we want to reduce this concentration if we can, um, maybe part of the wear process, but we want to keep the oil clean and dry. Uh, water can cause corrosion as well. So here we're looking at the surface of a bearing. So it's always really good practice when you remove a bearing uh, to look at its surface. You can learn so much. But in this case, we've learned that the bearing failed or had to be replaced because of corrosion. In, in this case, what's happened is there's been enough moisture in the oil that it's come out of solution and it's pulled up around the rollers. So you can see where the water sort of sat there Oh, sorry, and this is a stationary machine. So let's say we've got a standby pump. There's uh, uh, water in the lubricant. The water sort of sat around the rolling elements, caused corrosion. And so this standby pump that's supposed to be there when needed, you might switch over to unit B and potentially within hours that bearing will fail because of this problem. Um, so let's have a look at particulate contamination. Now it's another way of saying particles of various various sorts in the uh, in the lubricant. So I've mentioned already we've got this one micron gap. Let's just explore. I've mentioned that a few times now. Let's just put that in perspective. If this was a grain of sand, now yeah, it looks like an awfully big grain of sand, but if we blew a grain of sand up so it was that size, there's a human hair. Uh, we've got pollen. We'll see coal dust, we've got bacteria, and tobacco smoke. These little tiny particles that you see floating around are one micron in size relative to the size of a grain of sand, uh, human hair, and so on. So you can see how small one micron really is. You, you, you know how thick a piece of hair is. Um, this one represents the smallest thing that you can see with the naked eye. So if I just switch to this slide, you can see there's my grain of sand, which is approximately 100 micron, 100 millionth, millionths of a meter human hair. Well, there's our 40 microns. So you can see, you know, at the one extreme, here's tobacco smoke or, you know, the gap uh, that's holding those two bearing surfaces or two gear surfaces apart. Over here, if you made a pin prick in a piece of paper, let's say with a, with a pin, that's generally what you make pin pricks with, that's probably around one and a half millimeters. Now, I'm sorry I don't have that in Imperial, but you get the idea. It's, you know, this, this radius here, it, it looks huge compared to these other things, and it is. Um, anyway, bottom line is, we're talking about a very small gap. So there is no way, for example, that you can hold up an oil sample and look for particle contamination. If you can see particles, they are much bigger than 40 microns, um, if you can see them easily. Uh, those small particles of one, well, particularly as we'll see in a minute, it's particles around 3 and 4 microns that really do a lot of damage, that sort of size range. Um, yeah, there's no way you can see those. There's, there's no way you can sort of rub the oil in between your fingers and, and feel those particles. A, here's a, a little test membrane used as part of a microscopic test, as you can see there. Um, the pore size happens to be 1.2 micron, but each of these little grid squares here are 3.1 millimeters by 0.1, oh, sorry, 3.1 millimeter square or 0.1 of an inch square. So you can see that the grids are quite small. And you can see in this case, you can just see this particle, but we've already magnified it. You know, you couldn't see it there. Where, where is that particle? I can't see it. When we zoomed in, you can see it. So let's keep zooming. So there's 15x uh, magnification. We can see one up here. You can see one there. You know, maybe there's, there's others as well. But they're pretty small. We go into 50x magnification, 100x. 500 times magnification and now you can really see what the particle looks like. In this particular case it's about <coughs> about 40 microns long about 12, 10 microns wide. Um, so this is a particle that technically I'd have to put my glasses on but technically you'd be able to see a particle of this size. Well it's roughly 40 microns in length. 
Um, now, you might think, OK, what, what can a particle like that do? You might imagine that those particles might be soft and they just get squished between the rolling elements, they get squished between the gear teeth and the lubricant washes it away. Well, there may be some soft metal particles that, um, that and that'll happen. And that's not what we're too worried about. We can also have very small particles that do get trapped um, and they do cause some sort of deformation, that sort of bending that you can see there, but they may not do any damage. Um, this is really what we're thinking about. It's very small particles that are hard enough that when they get trapped between the gear teeth or trapped between the rolling elements, you know, the rolling element and in this case the outer race, it will do damage. Now you might look at that and say, oh yeah, but that's just this little tiny bit of damage and, you know, is, is that really bad? Well, that's how this started. There was a tiny bit of damage and that little damage area got bigger and bigger. As, as each rolling element rolled by, even though the particle might have been sort of washed away, um, the rolling element rolls by and the corners break away or the edges break away and it gets bigger and bigger and this is what happens. So you might look at a bearing and see these spalls, you know, people often call them, just these, you know, big patches where there's damaged area. Well, it might have all come from this tiny little particle that, you know, created an indentation and the bearing pounded away on it night and day, each rotation, and we have these, these problems. The other thing that can happen is a particle can kind of be pushed along and this soft babbit surface can be damaged as a result. So you know, there's a lot we could talk about of different um, wear mechanisms and what these particles can do, but hopefully you get the idea that basically we don't want particles to get in our machine. Uh, likewise with, with a gearbox, you know, the, this particle, and this is the same particle, we're just repeating this particular part, you know, it gets driven in between these two surfaces. With a gear we have rolling contact and sliding contact. Anyway, we do damage to the gears and the same sort of thing happens as we talked about with the bearings. Um, in fact, there's a lot of similarities between the sort of damage you can do to the gears as with the bearings. Now this is a, a very important study that was performed by Dr. P.B. McPherson and focusing on military helicopter gearboxes, but still. The idea was let's try different filter settings and see how that affects the life of the gears. So they started with 40 micron filtration. So here we have this point here and we achieved, well they achieved roughly three, let's just call it a little more than three million cycles to failure. And then they said, okay, let's filter it with a 25 micron filter. So we achieved an improvement by imp improving the uh, filter rating. We've now got four million cycles to failure. So they said, right, let's see if we can do better than that. Let's go to 10 micron filtration you know, yawn, we've gone down to 10 micron filtration and we're now, we've got it to 5 million cycles. Well, you know, I say yawn, it, we're not seeing this dramatic increase, but hey, you know, I'll take this increase in, in life any time. But let's see what happens when we kept on improving the filter rating. We get to 3 micron filtration and look at the effect we had Dr. P.B. McPherson had um, by increasing the level of filtration. So the real money is with filtering down to this sort of 3 and 4 micron level. It's those small particles that get between the gear teeth, that get between the rolling elements. Um, that's what does the damage. The great big particles, well they're kind of too big if you like. Now they may be broken down into the smaller particles. We don't want them in there, but they're not what does the damage. And in fact, if we go back to the study that we started the uh, presentation with, we see these great improvements, but the point that I didn't make is that what they did is they started with the filtration process and achieved certain results and then thought, no, we want to do better. So they went from 30 micron filtration to 12 microns to 6 microns to 3 microns. And that's what we see, this, this progress that's made here which was sustained, as you can see, year on year. They keep getting these benefits. You know, they might have to replace filters. Um, 
They might have had some extra expense in setting up a proper clean environment and all of that, but hey, what a great investment. Because while they made these changes, they went from 12, average 12 bearings failures per year to 9 to 4 to 1. One failure per year, and we can see this, this curve here. And at the same time, they increased the mill rate as you can see, almost by a factor of three. Now, increasing the speed of a bearing is supposed to have a linear effect on the life of the bearing. So if we increase the speed by a factor of three, we expect to reduce the life of the bearing by a factor of three. But we didn't increase the or reduce the bearing life, we increased it uh, all at the same time. So hopefully that should convince anyone that these measures, which just in case you're not familiar with Mobius, we don't sell filters and desiccant breathers, you know, we don't have some sort of um, vested interest in saying you should do these things, you know, we're a training company, we're just here to inform you of, of the sorts of practices that you can change to achieve greater reliability. Anyway, so, uh, how do you eliminate these, these particles? Well, as we saw in that chart early on, you know, there's lots of different sources of, of particulate contamination. But number one, we don't want to put them into the gearbox in the first place. So we need to make sure that the oil is filtered and the containers are clean and everything else which we'll talk about in a second. Number two, as the machine is operating we don't want particles to get into the oil so we have to look at how that can happen. It can happen through uh, breathers, it can happen you know when you pull out a dipstick and put it back in, uh, and uh, when you take oil samples and so on and actually that's the third option so when we can we can contaminate the oil when we take samples on the oil um, and finally there will be you know you may not have perfect techniques for eliminating contamination you might work in a very dirty environment and it may be hard but don't just make the assumption that because it's a dirty environment it's impossible to to achieve good results but uh, the, you might get contamination from the process and just through wear. So we need to filter them out of the uh, of the lubrication system, and we can do that with you know inline filters, and we can do it with filter carts and and so on, uh, inline and offline and filter carts. So number one, you buy that lubricant at great costs from one of the suppliers, and when it left the supplier, like when it um, uh, you know, came from the refinery itself. That lubricant was probably very clean and good. But it goes through a number of processes before you get it. And then you get it and you might contaminate it even further. So here was an experiment on a, on a drum of oil poured through this bag you can see here and then looked at closely. Now this isn't under microscope or anything. You know, you can see the, the ruler that's sitting there. And, okay, it's metric, but you get the idea. Look at the particles. Now these are large particles. These particles were left behind when the oil was, was passed through this filter material. Um, yes, these particles are really large and I've just told you that it's the really small particles that do the damage. But you can't see the really small particles that are, have been trapped as well. Um, this material may not have trapped the really small particles by the way. Um, but these large particles will get smashed up by the machine potentially and turn into small particles. So the bottom line is that oil that you've got uh, may well be contaminated. It may be because of the drum, it may be because of the transfer process, it could be for a, an, a number of reasons. The point is it probably wouldn't pass your particular ISO code test uh, when you put it into the machine. And then even if you have got clean oil, then you go ahead and do this. You take this grotty old container that's sitting there open to the environment and you pour this beautiful clean liquid into that container that could be contaminated with other lubricants or water and particles. And so you put it in there, you trot along to the machine and top up the reservoir or whatever you're doing with it and um, <clears throat> you just contaminated that lubricant. There are companies out there that will help you do this sort of thing. You know, create clean storage areas, very well organized uh, storage areas. Um, you know, if I look at this slide here, you can see they've used color coding. So they've said, okay, we're going to put, you know, we're going to 
put yellow on this drum and we'll put a yellow tag on the on the gearbox where this lubricant is going to be used for example and a, this is the red lubricant blue lubricant and so on so we make sure we don't put the wrong lubricants in the wrong machine um, we're going to put a, a desiccant breather on the drum as well so as it breathes even in this in controlled environment it will breathe particularly as you're pumping liquid out and stuff it's going to want to suck the uh, air in and so we put a desiccant breather on there which dries the air as it goes in and removes any dust particles and so on that will be in the air. Notice also that as the uh, gentleman here is filling this container um, it's being filtered as well and hopefully down to a good filtration level and they're using a nice container you know a red lid because this is the red uh, lubricant it's going to be added to the red machine and this container here will be kept clean so it's always sealed so um, you know you need to think about that it's fine to go and buy all this stuff but you know unfortunately I got this great photo that I couldn't find for this presentation but it um, you know it's this photo of all these containers that they've bought from one of these companies and they're all sitting out in the open as dirty as can be so yeah they've gone to the expense of buying these fancy containers um, which are very important and well worth their money but if you don't keep them clean well it's sort of a pointless effort wasn't it so anyway these are the sorts of things you can do there's companies that will help you do it yes it will take a bit of an investment but the investment is worth it um, now this has got nothing to do with you know the, the brand of oil the fact is these are being left in an open environment and all the dust from the environment is sitting on top so unless you do a darn good cleaning job before this lubricant is used you know you will get some of that those particles uh, into the oil as uh, you know, when you open the drum and when it's, when it's transferred. Um, this is a particular uh, iron ore mining site um, where all the lubricants are being kept out in the environment so it's a, it's a dry area, it's out in the Pilbara although mind you they get cyclones and there's a wet season and everything so these containers you know the sun's going to heat them up, cool them down, they're going to suck the moisture in and as you can see it's a very dirty and dusty environment you know here to stop it from dripping they turn the tap around so that's how it's sort of normally left we can just imagine all the particles that will fall in there it'll be twisted around and used to fill some sort of container and all those particles will just go right into that container you know here you can see all kinds of crap up on top of the uh, storage container so obviously from what you've learned it's not a good thing um, earlier I mentioned that you can get uh, uh, con contamination can occur while you pull out a dipstick and when you perform uh, lubrication samples and so on. Well there are plenty of very good commercial products that are affordable that give you good uh, connection points uh, that can be sealed, you know, sight glasses that are easy to see, you don't need to use a dipstick um, you know, all of these techniques can be used. A bit of money, a bit of effort, worth every cent. Um, so you just got to look, you know, here's a, a motor driving a gearbox which uh, turns a, the conveyor drive and, um, you know, it's a dirty environment so, you know, if a dipstick's removed, uh, when oil's added, you know, contamination's going to occur, it's just going to happen. Um, you got to remember too that the air has a, a lot of dust in it, you know, even, I mean, certainly in some environments it's like mining and cement and so on it's going to have more dust but in any environment you know this photo I love this photo but um, you know that's a, a dust storm about to hit what looks like a military base in uh, China but anyway these happen in some places but yeah it doesn't have to be that bad the fact is that the gearbox as it heats up and cools down and as the uh, lubricant level goes down it sucks air in that air might have moisture so a desiccant breather will do the job that dust will have, that air will have particles and the breather needs to filter that out a lot of breathers that are supplied with gearboxes just aren't up to the job no way Jose you know here you can see you know 
there may be some filter material behind there as well but you know it might keep the bugs out but that's about all that's doing um, so you just got to look at your gearbox and say well what's the situation could I be sucking contaminants in you know this gearbox tells a story but it's all cleaned up We've added proper connectors added a breather and and now we should see much greater life from this very critical gearbox you know it's expensive uh, it's doing a very important role when it goes down production stops um, <clears throat> now one of the things that we can do is filter the lubricant we can filter the lubricant once it's in the machine and we can filter the lubricant before it goes into the machine but just as I said before that you know oils ain't oils well filters ain't filters either it's important to understand just what the capabilities of the filters you're using are so in this case this has a, a nominal rating so that whether it's 10 microns or whatever the filter rating is that's its nominal rating that basically means that it'll stop 50 percent of the particles that are coming through so if you used such a filter when filtering the oil uh, as it was transferred from a, a drum to a dispensing container it's still going to contain 50 percent of the particles that's all that means if it has an absolute rating then it will remove far more of the particles there will still be some particles filters aren't perfect perfect but um, you just have to be aware there's also this beta ratio that is used to define just how effective the filter is uh, this illustration as you can see is from Paul Filter Corporation or just Paul Corporation and what I can show you here is that if a filter has a beta ratio of 2 then it has you know 50 percent efficiency and that's what we're seeing here if it has a beta ratio of 20 it has 95 percent filter efficiency but you can see that uh, you know of, of you know, a million particles going in, we're getting 50,000 particles coming out uh, past the filter, in this case for 10 microns. But we can increase the beta ratio, you know, up to this point. Um, now, you know, the people who supply these filters, you know, they'll charge you a bit more, but the question is, you know, depending on the application, uh, you get what you pay for and it's important to understand these sorts of ratings to make sure you are getting what you actually need um, now some people may have tried using filters like this and they say oh, but they keep blocking well yeah they keep blocking because you got particles in the oil you know any filter that blocks is sending you a big loud message you have too many particles in your oil so you need to look at where those particles are coming from you need to look at the the system you're using to perform filtration um, because they shouldn't be blocking and if they are well they're doing their job and you know it's the cost of doing business in your industry if you just cannot find a way to avoid the contamination then the filter will just have to be replaced more frequently what's the cost of filtration versus the cost of downtime and damage and replacement gear parts and, and all of that that's the question you have to ask now I mentioned you know filters ain't filters well it even gets worse because in industry these days there are all sorts of companies out there that will sell you filters and bearings and other components that are not genuine they do not meet the rating that they might put on the outside of the filter so here we have a proper commercial filter designed to do its job it won't rust it'll do the filtering job that it was specified to do here's a dodgy brother filter and you know, it's rusting and you can just see it's just not going to filter you know do a good job at all so you need to be aware of that and uh, make sure you are getting them from a good supplier like I say we don't sell filters I'm not trying to say anything um, it's just an important fact so you know thanks for viewing this presentation I hope we've got certain messages across that the correct lubrication that the correct lubricant and oil cleanliness is critical to the life of the bearings and gears within a gearbox plenty of companies provide the tools necessary to ensure that the lubricant remains clean um, and it is not too expensive to do this work 
and it does not require a PhD. You know, uh, everything that I've just talked about is is just practical common sense. Yes, you know, you may want to read up on it or do some training, and yes, we do training, but you can look at those sources, you can eliminate those sources, you can get consultants in to just say, or even just the product suppliers, okay, what sort of filtration would you recommend in this case? You know, what sort of systems do you have to keep containers clean and, and all those other things. You can also look at the testing techniques. It's really a subject for a different presentation, but the way you test the lubricant can tell you, um, you know, tell you about the lubricant properties themselves and knowing about the lubricant properties tells you whether the lubricant's doing a good job and therefore tells you if you need to replace that lubricant. So rather than doing time-based replacement of lubricants, you can potentially save thousands. In fact, we did a project when I was living in the US for the uh, Military Sealift Command, Division of the Navy, uh, part of the Navy, and uh, they quoted savings in the millions because they didn't have to replace the oil as often because of the tests they were performing and as a result they didn't have the purchase costs, the storage costs and the disposal costs that they had when they just went with uh, sort of time-based replacement of the lubricant. So you can base all your decisions on these tests. Is the lubricant doing a good job? Is it contaminated? And are there wear particles? There are lots of companies that will, you know, do those tests for you. There's equipment you can buy to do those tests on site. There are ways to take samples properly without, you know, taking them from the correct point in the lubrication cycle, um, not, lubri not contaminating the sample, not contaminating the lubricant as part of that process. Anyway, I hope I've convinced you that this is something that presents a great opportunity for you to improve reliability and thus increase production, improve product quality, reduce downtime, make a safer, safer plant and so on. So thank you very much for viewing this presentation. I do want to give credit to Dario Petreschi. He, um, he runs his own consulting business uh, but has a lot of expertise in this area and he has helped get me up to speed on these topics and provided some of these uh, graphics. So a lot of our uh, training in this area was co-authored by Daray. Anyway, thank you very much for viewing this presentation. I really hope you found it useful.